welcome to the Promoted Podcast. I'm your host, Felicity Fury, CEO of Wears Fire, and I'm joined with by the incredible Renee Wooden, aerospace engineer, commercial pilot, and speaker. You're having a bit of a giggle, Renee. If I put you on the I spot, am. I'm feeling you know uncomfortable topic. about today's topic. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So, you know what? I'm going to spin this intro on its head because I get to introduce the phenomenal Felicity Fury. She is an absolute powerhouse. She's a co-founder, a CEO of multiple businesses, to be frank. You run a charity, a nonprofit organization. You have two beautiful children. You have an incredible partnership with your husband. And you're an absolute weapon of an engineer who's had just the most phenomenal career. So what a pleasure to hold this space with you and have these conversations. Oh, thanks, Renee. You're too kind. I do get to steal the intro, so I love that you flipped it around. I think we should do that more often. That was very fun. Well, today's topic well, is going to be a tricky one. We've got uh, we've got some butterflies in the tummy. I know I do for sure, and makes sense because we're going to dive into having difficult conversations. And I think as a leader or as anyone, actually, if you I don't know if you speak to any humans out there, then this is something that you probably need to do. It could actually be a difficult conversation in your family. With with your friends, with your partner, or in the workplace. And I reckon this is probably our most requested topic to train first-time leaders in is can you help our people improve or actually go have? It's not even like improve the conversations because a lot of the time they're just not having them, they're avoiding them. So how do you go have a difficult conversation? We've got a framework that has been really helpful for us, but before we get into that, Renee, I'd love to hear... Sounds like this is something that you've got on your mind. How do you think I about so many feelings about this topic? So many feelings. Okay, <laughs> so I'm just going to start with the fact that, you know, we've just had a conversation about self-confidence and if you haven't already heard it, make sure you go and jump into one of our previous episodes on self-confidence. But I think that to have these sorts of conversations, you need to come from a place of strong self-confidence and That essentially means that you've self-reflected enough to say, okay, something's upset me, I have my boundaries, I have my values, this has conflicted with some of those things and therefore I might need to go and have a conversation with someone or perhaps it's not even a conversation you need to go and have but it's certainly a conversation you need to have with yourself because someone may have again you know, walked a line that you weren't comfortable with and you've got to pick your battles. So which conversation do you have? Is it the one you have with yourself or is it the one you have with the individual? And so being able to process those emotions, that was so super important. And I, I guess to start this conversation, I do want to kind of just give people a safe space to say, you're human. We all have emotions and people trigger each other, whether it's at home in your community or in your workplace. We have all been raised in different ways. We have different things that push us past that comfort zone. Uh, We have different levels of tolerance. Some people are far more calm. Some people are far more uptight. So how do you respect that people generally have good intent, but sometimes they take things too far? And so how do you get comfortable making it clear that hey, your team member has kind of said something, it's rubbed you up the wrong way, they've done it a couple of times and now it's time for a conversation. How do you prepare for the city for these sorts of conversations? I want to hear from you first. Oh, well, it's interesting you said self-confidence because I feel like that's how I know it's a difficult conversation is that I'm going, oh, my gosh, how am I going to have it? <laughs> so I think, yeah, like there's the, I feel there's the easy difficult conversations where you're like, oh, this person is just like, okay, it's fine, I can handle this because I am really strong on my values. Say it's, uh, I don't know, behaving inappropriately. I'm like, cool, this is an easy conversation to have because I know it like really doesn't work. I think the most difficult ones are the ones where it is I can see their perspective or I find often when I'm running a business and a huge thing for the business is optics. So it's like, okay, it might not actually be on paper be that bad, but the optics are really bad. I'm sure you found this in working with big corporates as well, where you have to take the position of the business and you might not necessarily agree with that personally, or if it was up to you, you would do it in a different way. But because ultimately, especially when you're in a very senior leadership role or you're a director of a company, your job as a director is to act in the interest of the organization. That's your job. So that can be quite, quite difficult. So I feel, yeah, if it's a difficult one, I'm even like, 
having flashbacks now of ones that I've had. And I think the other thing to keep in mind before we get into the framework that, that we have is that you can always go back and have another conversation. I feel like that is more like a belief rather than a truth. <laughs> but if you have a conversation, it doesn't go well, then you can always go back and have another conversation. And I think that really helps me go, you might stuff it up. That's okay. You can always kind of go, let's like, let's restart that. So you might have a different opinion on that, Renee, but I think you can always go in and have um have a different conversation. Well, on that, do you what do you think? Do you think you can go back again or are you like one time that's it, you're out? Oh, I think that it depends, right? I think that yeah. if you get your message across in a really concise, respectful way the first time, then hopefully you don't have to go back for a round two. But I've certainly had repeat offenders that have violated what I would say is my boundaries around respect in the yeah. workplace. And they've done that on countless occasions over, you know, years. And so I've had to have repeat conversations. And I am actually reflecting on the support I had to have those conversations. Um, you know, I think it's so great to go in prepared when you need to have conversations because mm -hmm. they are emotional and I feel like our psyche is just like, I don't want to cause conflict. I don't want to upset somebody. I don't want to tell somebody what I really think because I don't want there to be ramifications or ongoing conflict mm -hmm. as a result. And it's really hard to be bold enough to share your vulnerabilities and mm -hmm. um, to be honest, particularly in a place where we're kind of taught in the workplace to, you know, always be respectful. Don't, don't, you know, show your true colors or cards or emotions because you need to maintain balance. You need to maintain respect. You need to mm -hmm. create a harmonious workplace for everybody around you. So, Sometimes that means you need to kind of hold it in. Other times that means you need to go and have a hard conversation. <laughs> so uh, I'm taken back to a conversation I probably had to have about a year ago now. And, and uh, this person was getting under my skin and um, I was getting quite emotional about it. And I think I've shared this one question with you before, uh, Felicity, which is, my mentor asked me, why do you care what they think so much? And that was a really great point of uh, reflection for me because I almost was able to just kind of lift that weight off my shoulders and stop caring because I actually couldn't answer that question. I mm. cared because my values were being violated, mm. but why does that matter? What is it? A Apart from a bit of an ego bruise or just me wanting to be respected, there was no further ramifications. So it was something I just kind of had to just let go of essentially. Yeah. And then second to that, um, I was taught by this mentor to really not get defensive when you're having conversations, to really actively listen um, mm. to people's answers to your questions. And when you're asking somebody uh, make sure you keep asking why. So, for example, you've done this thing, I just want to understand why you felt you needed to do that. And the reason why that's important is because then the other person has to explain their feelings and their reaction. And you don't have to then sit there and say, you've done this, it's made me feel like this, I don't want you to do that again because that's almost that defensive position, whereas if you try and understand mm -hmm. the other person, perhaps you'll be you know, pleasantly surprised or it puts them in the hot seat really. And I think that yes. that's really important because you can kind of then lead the conversation. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I'm in a position at the moment where someone is again violating my values <laughs> and, um, and again, I, I don't think it's out of malice by any means. I think it's just that people have different ways of operating. And so, it's up to me that if that continues to happen time and time again, then eventually if it's still bothering me, it's up to me to then have that uncomfortable conversation. Um, yeah, and so I think that this is so valuable as a conversation um, and I would love to hear the framework that you have because this is something that all of our listeners, you know, anyone that is seeking a leadership role has to get good at. So where do they start, Felicity? A hundred percent. And you kind of, you've touched on it a lot in this conversation, which is super cool, Renee. So I think the key thing there is that you just talked about was seeking first to understand rather than to be understood. 
which is a great one of the seven habits of highly effective people in Stephen Covey's book, which is so, so good to know. And I think often when we're coming into these conversations, yeah, that what's on your mind is like, they're an idiot. Can't they see they're being like this to me? And <laughs> everyone has different values and none of them are wrong. It's just different. Like I, this example recently happened where Michael, my husband, went into Super Cheap Auto. So Super Cheap Auto, you know, from the name, you're going to guess they give you the cheap parts, right? So we wanted windscreen wipers. We went in and Michael said, are these the best? And the guy said, yep, these are the best. So he comes out with these like little blade things he's trying to like clip in. He's like, this is ridiculous. This is not what I want. These seem really cheap and horrible. So he went back and he said to the guy, are these the best? Now, Michael's version of the best is something that was quick and easy, didn't care so much about cost. This this guy who's like a young young kind of guy, uh, probably, you know, late teens, early 20s, he was like his version of the best was the cheapest. Not at all what Michael wanted. So that day we went to Super Cheap Auto three times to get Michael's version of the best, which wasn't the version <laughs> of the person. <laughs> so not really a difficult conversation, but you can see how values can be quite different even when it's the word like the best. So no no one's wrong. It's just, oh, okay, they're different. I think that's a really helpful thing to unpack and understand, particularly when you're working in a leadership role, you've got a team or you're working with colleagues in a team that people have different values to and none of them are wrong. They're just different. So yeah, at any point where you can understand someone else first before saying what you want. And like you said, Renee, not be defensive is really, really powerful. So the framework that we use, and I even Michael and I use this together, one of the things about being married to your business partner is you have to actually work through all the conversations and the difficult ones too, because you can't quit. You can't go home and complain about your colleague. They're, just, they're always there. And it's going to be in every <laughs> aspect of your life. So we do, I think what's really great about working together, even though it's challenging, is that we do need to communicate completely and resolve everything pretty quick smart because you're parenting together you've got you know work together and you've got life together so the framework that we use is called face so face stands for feelings and framing so you want to acknowledge your feelings which you've spoken a lot about Renee like the emotions is a big one there for those difficult conversations so whenever I'm going into a difficult conversation and it could just be like a two-minute conversation with someone uh, I talk to Michael about this a lot because usually we're going and having these difficult conversations in our business or wherever we're at um what am I how am I feeling about it usually it's like I'm pissed off I hate their guards I'm angry I don't want to do it I hate being responsible like all the stuff of a leader so it's like whatever however you're feeling about it and you're right Renee like it's okay to feel emotional and I think acknowledging it and naming it before you get into the conversation is really really powerful so the first piece is is the feelings and then the framing so kind of like what you're saying earlier actually it's like I've noticed this behavior or hey this is happening in the team or we've got to deliver this project and it could be something like there's two of you working on a project together You've got different ways of delivering it, but ultimately you have the same goal. You want to see the same result. You both want to see that project delivered. So the framing could be, hey, you and I, we want the same thing, right? We want a successful project that's on time and under budget or whatever the the project is. Yeah, okay, we do. All right, we've got this common ground that we're kind of working towards. So that could be some framing, particularly if there's a clash on a project. So that, and, and that is such a game changer. It can really, you know, completely change the direction of a conversation. The second one is A, so asking questions. So not accusing, um, asking those questions of, you know, I've noticed this, what's been your perspective? Or even like around the goal, what do you think in that framing? Or uh, we've no, I've noticed this happening, has that been your feelings as well? Or has it been something different? So asking as many questions as, as you can and asking not accusing too, which is kind of like a tricky one to get right. Uh, the third is C, so being curious. So curiously engaged in the conversation, have, you know, really listening to what they're saying. And like this one shocks me because I've had so many conversations where I've gone in and like assumed like, oh, they're such a so-and-so and they've done this and they're completely wrong. And I've gone <laughs> in and gone like, hey, why would you do it like that? And they'd be like, oh, because you said A, B, and C. And you're like, oh, my gosh, I did say A, B, and C, but that was not what I intended for you to do, but you have actually done what I said, 
based on that communication, how you interpret it. So often I am wrong. <laughs> uh, so being curious. <laughs> no, you just um, framed it better. <laughs> because we could have framed it better. Uh, I think particularly when we've had some incredible admin people from the Philippines, and I love them so much. They're so good at their job. And I communicate in one way and they do exactly what I say, but that's not what I meant. <laughs> so often that can be a trip up for me, I think, in having a difficult conversation. Or, you know, like we've had some tricky ones with clients where I've been, you know, they've been on, unha- you know, me thinking back to the charity where a partner hasn't been happy and getting curious of like, why didn't that work for you? Why was that a problem for you? Oh, okay. And why did that matter? And why was that important? And just really being curious about, I think that you can overdo the questions, but you know, you can use common sense there. And then the last one is expectations. So setting expectations for what you expect going forward and expectations for yourself. So face feelings and framing, asking, not accusing, C is curious and E is expectations. Renee, is that going to help you with your upcoming difficult conversation or yeah, how did that how yes. did that go for you? You're giving me the confidence to go and have this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I've already written up my notes on what I want to say. Now I just have to deliver it. So yeah. preparation yeah. is not in face, but preparedness for these conversations will go a very yes. long way too. Because yeah. I think what it does, it takes the emotion out. And it gives you a script to follow so that if you do feel things coming up or you're losing your confidence, mm-hmm. you can just stick to the script because you, you've already done your homework, you've already prepared. Uh, it just yes. gives you that extra level of security. But, I mean, these sorts of things do come up so often. I think that, you know, if I think about you and Michael, Felicity, you've really demonstrated how how to be that effective in a, uh, a romantic and intimate relationship, how do you navigate, you know, maintaining a really solid, solid foundation of communication with your husband? And it's something that I've really applied in my life. You've really inspired me in the way that you apply that that framework and, and really are bold enough to have really difficult conversations. Um, And, you know, I think that goes a long way in, you know, setting up your future um, as a leader in any sort of environment, because when you start applying these principles and these frameworks, you, you need to do it with everyone because you can't assume whether it's your best friend, whether it's your partner, whether it's your family member or your colleague, you can never assume where people's intent was or what their understanding was or their lack of understanding was. So, um, Mm. you know, try and, I guess, vent to someone in your circle who you, who is a trusted confidant, reach out to that mentor, speak to that counsellor, that psychologist, whatever it takes to help you get prepared and Mm. then go in with a really open mind and a level of calm. If you walk into a conversation calm, you'll make the other person feel calm. They will mirror your behaviour as well. I think that's important. So, Mm. um Hard conversations, I don't think they ever get easier uh, in terms of that initial response when people violate your feelings or your values and and you feel that triggered animal-ish response. But (laughs) I think the beautiful thing is you have that choice to to not respond in a moment, to walk away, gather yourself, you know, process your emotions, plan out your response, and then go in as a true leader. 100%. Another great app. Thanks, Renee. So good. And it's funny because every time, like I know this framework and every time Michael and I go, let's use a framework, it like it totally works. And I feel like for me the biggest one is the feelings and just getting and then then asking questions, getting someone's other perspective because I am not someone who the feelings are not the most obvious thing for me, even though they're right there and I might be like angry talking about this topic about like, oh, I've got to go talk to this person and I don't want to do it. Um, But once (laughs) it's even like, Actually, it stop to think. Oh, yeah, people are idiots. No, uh, that you know that that it's that. Oh, it's funny because I just don't. It's not my automatic thing to think about my feelings. But then when I actually go, I am finding it difficult. Oh, why? Oh, because I feel like an idiot, or like I'm worried about what they're going to say, or like I'm really emotional 
it's just, I don't know, but I just feel emotional about it. Just acknowledging that makes, I feel like that's 90% of the work for me. And like you said, Renee, doing that, that moment to prep, like it could just be like a two second conversation before you walk into the meeting, like, oh my gosh, how am I feeling? Because you might be in back to back meetings and you might have just come from another meeting that was really stressful. And now you're bringing that into your next meeting. So I think if you just can get to the feelings and acknowledge that and that emotion um, and, and get the, the framing right, like you've done 90% of the conversation, because that's what usually trips me up. So. So good, Renee. You'll have to let us know how you go with your difficult conversation, you know, offline, online. So thank you for the preparation session. We are doing live feedback, everybody. So (laughs) our next app, uh, I'll give everybody the goss, but feeling good now. Um, I'm feeling ready. Awesome. So good. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Promoter Podcast, the podcast that helps you get promoted and be great when you get there. Let us know what you think. Let us know your questions. We'd love to answer. We love seeing DMs come in and hearing from all of you, our lovely audience. Have a good end to your day, Renee. We'll see you in the next episode. See you in the next episode. Enjoy your day, Felicity. 